Hello and welcome to the second session of our devotional series, Renew. My name is Kim Hyland, and I am very grateful for the opportunity to be together with you today. You know, it's interesting how we come together lately, isn't it? Obviously, we are not together in person. We're not even together in real time, but instead we are together from the comfort of our homes, which has its benefits. I hope you are relaxed and comfortable and like me have just snuck away to a quiet spot. Maybe it's early in the morning and you're still in bed. Maybe it's late at night and you're looking at this right before you go to sleep. Uh, maybe if you are in a full house, you have snuck outside and are sitting in your car or you are hiding in that most sacred of spots, the bathroom. Wherever you are, I'm just so glad you're here. And I wanna begin our time together with a prayer. Father, thank you that your spirit resides in us and your spirit is unbound by time and place. And so I'm grateful that because of that, we truly can be together in the deepest sense of the word. God, I thank you that because of your spirit in us, that we are together, not only with one another, but with all believers around the world. Lord, I thank you that your great cloud of witnesses is with us, Lord. And God, we need that strength and that unity right now. Lord, I pray that as we've stepped away from not only the busyness of our lives, but just away from some hard and um, sometimes frightening and unnerving circumstances, that your Holy Spirit would come and give us your peace that passes understanding. Lord, thank you that you are Emmanuel, that you are God with us. And Lord, as we look at your word and consider what it means to be restored by you, would you meet each one of us in a really special way, Lord? We give this time to you in Jesus' name, amen. You know, in the beginning of these circumstances um, that we've found ourselves in, in the last um, how many weeks? You know, we can't even remember what day it is, but it feels like it's been a while. But right around the beginning, I think there was a lot of discussion about fear or faith. So are we gonna respond to um, the circumstances in fear or faith? And I get it, I, I think it's an important challenge, but I kept asking myself the question, is it really either or? because I don't know about you, but there have been days where I have felt my faith to be really strong. I've had peace that passes understanding. I have felt just um, strong in the Lord and, and unafraid. And then there have been days where I have had heart pounding fear. Um, there've been lit late nights where I've woken up and have really struggled to fall back to sleep because of fear and anxiety. And so I've just questioned, is it, is it really fear or faith? Our undeniable circumstances right now, I think, reveal a truth that is reality all the time. And that is that we are vulnerable. And scripture confirms this, Psalm 103, compares our lives to a blade of grass or a flower of the field. It says, as for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field for the wind passes over it and it is gone and its place knows it no more. In other words, he's forgotten. We are vulnerable and as vulnerable people, we feel afraid. Psalm 56.3 is one of my favorite scriptures. It says, it's simple. It says, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. And I love it because there are days where I don't feel afraid and my faith is strong. And there are days where I do feel fear and even overwhelmed by it. And so it's this recourse. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. And I just wanted to start 
with that today because I feel like fear is a reality. It manifests in a lot of different ways for different people, but I, I would imagine that um, maybe you've experienced that. So as we look at scripture today and look at what it means to be restored by the Lord, um, I just want you to keep that in your mind, that when I am afraid, I'll trust in you, and I'll probably come back to that a couple times. So last week, Lisa Adams assured us from Scripture that even in these scary times that we can rest, and Psalm 23 tells us why. Today, I want to begin by looking briefly at the meaning of the word restore and how it's used in Scripture. And as we do, I want you to just kind of take note of how it's a very pragmatic word. It's not some ethereal notion. It's not some hyper-spiritualized idea, but it means to restore. So the definition of restore is to bring back to a state of health, soundness, or vigor. It means to put back to a former place, position, or rank, or to give back, to make return or restitution of something that's been taken away or lost. And there are a few scriptures that you're probably familiar with that talk about restoration. Joel 2.25 says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. So God is promising to restore to his people, to give back to them what has been lost. Psalm 51.12 is a prayer of David, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And then as we heard in Psalm 23, verse 3 last week, it says, He, the good shepherd, restores my soul. But something precedes this spiritual restoration in every instance. And that something is a wholehearted turning to God. Let's look at them again. A few scriptures earlier in Joel 2 verses 12 to 13, there's a call to God's people, the Israelites, to repent. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning, and rend your hearts, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Psalm 51 is David's prayer of repentance after being confronted for his sin by the prophet Nathan. And after he repents, he says, God, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And then Psalm 23 is a declaration of deep dependence and confidence in the Lord who restores our soul. So the process of spiritual restoration is a collaboration of sorts between us and God. Obviously, we can't restore ourselves. So we look to God recognizing what only he can do, as well as what he requires from us. Restoration isn't passive. And Psalm 27 illustrates this and gives us really clear instructions on how to position ourselves to be restored by God. So when Lisa taught last week on Psalm 23, she read it and she asked you to listen for specific actions of God, what God was doing. So he provides, he feeds and guides, he defends. Today, as I read Psalm 27, I want you to listen for David's response and specific actions he takes, things that he says he will and won't do. So this is Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. 
For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, Seek my face, and my heart says to you, Your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. So the first thing I want you to see in this wonderful psalm is the overarching truth. And that's right there in verse 1. It is the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? This is the truth that everything else in this psalm hinges on. It's what makes everything else that follows reliable. The Lord is my light, my salvation, and my stronghold. He's my strength. He's my light. He brings clarity and order and understanding. He's my salvation. He's my deliverance. He's my rescue, he's my safety, and he's my welfare. And he is my stronghold. A stronghold is a place or a means of safety, protection, and refuge. Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. So now let's look at David's actions. And as we do, I want to consider practical ways to position ourselves to be restored. And the first action we see is that David says, I won't fear. Why not? Because the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And so a couple practical ways to not fear are to remember when I feel fear, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. As Psalm 56, 3 says, Another really practical way to combat fear is to make a list of God's truths, his attributes, and his promises. And as we look at this and I share these practical ways, if you think of a practical way, please make a note of it and share it with us when we meet in Zoom on Friday. So that's what David says he won't do. He won't fear. Now I want to look at five things that he says he will do. And the first is, I will be confident. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. The New American Standard Bible says, in this I will be confident. And what is the this that David is talking about? Why is he confident? And it goes right back to that verse 1. Because the Lord is his light, his salvation, and his stronghold and strength. So a couple practical ways to stand in confidence are to keep his truths in front of you. That might look like post-its posted around the house where you see scripture and you're reminded of what is true. A second way to stand in confidence is to get really bossy with your thoughts. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The second thing that we see David say he will do is, I will seek him. Verse 4, One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. 
And then in verse 8, David says, You have said, Seek my face. And my heart says to you, Your face, Lord, do I seek. The Amplified Version translates seek as to inquire for and insistently require. So you can see it's very intentional. It's very active. Your face, Lord, do I seek. I inquire for it, and I insistently even require. Verse 11 shows that David is open to, not only is he seeking, but he wants to be taught. And he says, teach me your way, O Lord. So some practical ways to earnestly seek God are the obvious. Make time with God in prayer and Bible study and make it a priority. Something that um, helps me sometimes is I don't allow myself any social media until I've spent that time with the Lord. Another very um, practical way to earnestly seek God is to seek Him in the morning and to seek Him in the afternoon and to seek Him in the evening, even if it's just for five minutes, to return to Him and to return to His Word and to return to prayer. And I've found this especially really, really helpful when um, I'm dealing with a lot of anxiety to just keep coming back throughout the day. The next thing we see David saying he will do is to praise the Lord. Verse 6 says, I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. He's bringing a sacrificial offering of joy. And I love that it says it's sacrificial, that it's a sacrifice of joy. Because that means I don't have to necessarily feel like it. I don't necessarily have to be in the mood to praise the Lord. But I can bring this sacrifice of joy. So some practical ways to praise God are, again, the obvious to, to sing. And uh, to keep worship music on in your home. To be reminded of what is true. Another one is to give thanks. And I think this would be a good time to have, you know, we have Christmas in July. Well, why not Thanksgiving in April? Giving thanks is such a powerful reminder to our hearts of God's goodness and faithfulness. And ways to do that is to write them down. Um, we have a chalkboard wall in our home and at, around Thanksgiving often that's where we'll just write down things that we're grateful for. But now would be a good time to do that too. If you have children, you can make it a game. When my kids were small, um, we used to do different things. You know, riding in the car, we'd play ping pong, meaning basically I would tell them something I was grateful for, and they would tell me something they were grateful for. Or we'd challenge each other, you know, what are th three things you're grateful for? A gratitude jar. Um, these are all things that you hear about at Thanksgiving, but again, I think that now would be a great time to exercise them. So a gratitude jar to um, put in throughout the day, you know, people write down things in the home, write down things that we're grateful for, and then read them aloud at dinner. And another way, a really practical way to praise God is to pray Psalm 141, verse 3. And that is, set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips, so that the things that would come out of my mouth would be things that would bring praise to him. The next thing we see David saying that he will do is to wait. Verse 14 says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. We position ourselves to wait expectantly and with courage. And some practical ways to wait are to prayerfully and specifically surrender our expectations to ask God to help us desire his will above all, and to immerse ourselves in the stories, both biblical and the personal stories that we have of God's faithfulness and his care, to tell those stories to our children, and the, to even write down the personal stories, those landmark moments in our lives where we've seen God come through and be faithful, and to just really remind our hearts of them. And then the last thing we see David do, it's not something he specifically says, I will do, but we see him doing it throughout this psalm, and that is to pray. The whole psalm is a prayer. 
but what I want you to notice is that it is very specific and honest petition. David doesn't minimize, he doesn't generalize or spiritualize his circumstances. Listen, he says, evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh. He's not minimizing his circumstances. In fact, it's possible that he's even exaggerating them to eat up his flesh. He uses words like army and war and enemies and the day of trouble, adversaries, false witnesses, and violence. In verse 7, he cries out, Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. And so some practical ways for us to pray are to pray honestly and boldly and to pray with confidence, knowing that God already knows our heart and mind and we don't have to hide anything from him, whether it's irrational fear or rational fear or anything in between. To pray honestly, to know that he loves us and he accepts us as is, and that his heart is tender toward us. He is a loving and caring and kind father who doesn't reject his daughter when she's afraid but instead comforts her. And so I encourage you to pray really honestly. Psalm 103 is true. We are vulnerable. And for all our trying, for all our delusions, there's nothing we can do to escape that reality. Our days are like grass. But the psalm doesn't end there. It goes on to say, but the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. I hope you have been encouraged. I hope you will join us this Friday in our Zoom call. And I, again, just thank you for taking this time. Be encouraged. I want to read that last scripture again because it's everything. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. God bless you.